Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this extraordinary meeting of Windsor Cowby Shire Council uh, on Wednesday, the 24th of November. Um, Acknowledgement of country. Windsor Cowby Shire Council acknowledge the Gundungara and Thurrawal people as the traditional custodians of this land we now call Windsor Cowby Shire. I pay my respect to elders both past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders either present here today or watching the prayer. Let us meet in this council chamber in a spirit of fellowship and goodwill to represent all members of the community in its cultural and religious diversity. To be honest and objective in all our deliberations. To respect the view of the residents, the rights of all residents to express their opinions with our fear or favour and to make decisions for the common good of the community. Um, obviously, there's no apologies. Uh, General Manager, declarations of interest? No declarations, Mr May. Um, Inter Administrator's Minute, there isn't one. Um, so we can go uh, straight into the, the business paper. Uh, the first item, 7.1. Um, Mr. Stephen Horn, the chair of the council's audit risk and improvement committee has asked, could he uh, speak to the council? Um, and that of course has been granted. Mr. Horn. Thank you, Mr. May. Thank you for the opportunity to make a short statement. Bit of context, back at that meeting on the 21st of April, 2021, council resolved to dissolve the audit risk and improvement committee, ARIC as they're called that was in place at that date. An updated ERIC charter was adopted at the same meeting based on emerging new sector-wide requirements from the Office of Local Government, OLG, and Council also resolved to undertake an open market recruitment process to re-establish the ERIC under the new charter. The results of that process were reported in the Council meeting of 28th of July, 2021, with appointments to the ERIC taking effect from the 1st of September, 2021. Whilst the ERICS Charter is a public document, I serve on a number of ERICS and elsewhere I have found it useful to take an early opportunity, such as this, to clarify the ERICS role as it's not always well understood. The ERIC is a unique committee in the council framework and I find it helpful to begin by clarifying perhaps what the ERIC is not. It does not oversight the conduct of councillors or the decisions made by council. Other mechanisms operate to provide accountability of that type. The ERIC is not a public facing committee and does not comprise community representation or participation. It does not serve as a public consultation or complaints mechanism. Neither does the ERIC assist council with operational matters as other committees do. The ERIC does not in any way alter the responsibilities and authority of either the body of councillors or the appointed management. It does not ratify council decisions nor approve management policies. The ERIC has no decision-making authority and cannot be delegated any such authority. So it cannot approve, direct or determine, but what it can do is inquire, review and recommend. It is a truly independent mechanism, which the OLG has created as part of a new governance framework for the New South Wales local government sector. The legislation that establishes ERICs will take full effect from 2022. The role set out for ARICs in the legislation is very substantial. So much so that ARICs for New South Wales councils will have the broadest mandate of any audit committees in the world. The ARIC will examine matters such as how well the council aligns operations to the needs of the community. Uh, Excuse me, so I just ask you to stop one second. Your light's going on and off. Does that normally happen or? I just want to make sure people at home can hear. All good? All good. My apologies. There you are. Thank you. Um, so the ERIC will examine matters such as how well the, the council aligns operations to the needs of the community, achieves its strategic objectives with a firm view on being efficient, effective and economical, uh, can improve levels of service delivery, can increase accountability and transparency, can achieve better decision making, can increase financial stability, 
could achieve and maintain compliance with all laws, regulations, internal policies and procedures, and can better safeguard their public assets. So there's an awful lot of scope in the role of the ERIC. The guidelines from OLG relating to these matters are currently still draft, pending final consultation with the sector. Feedback on those guidelines closes this coming Friday, 26th of November, and we expect to see the final guidance material issued during the first quarter of 2022. I can advise that the new ERIC here is in situ, underway, and that Windsor Caribbean is ahead of the timeline set out by OLG for implementing the new requirements relating to the ERIC, to internal audit and to risk management. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. And look, I think uh, the community is lucky to have representatives on the ERIC of the calibre of yourself and your colleagues. And I look forward um, in the short time I'm here uh, to receiving information from you of um, audits you undertake. So thank you very much. And if you wouldn't mind just staying until the end of the meeting, because I'd like you to draw some names out of a hat to turn some lights on in, in some towns in the Shire. Will be the pinnacle of my career. I look forward to it. <laughs> okay. Um, I would uh, move uh, that Mr. Horn be thanked for his informative advice. And two, in accordance with Council's decision of 10 November 2021, the General Manager be requested to liaise with the Chair of the Audit Risk and Improvement Committee to implement as soon as possible the draft guidelines, particularly in relation to the annual work plan. And I declare that carried. The next item is the presentation of the audited financial statements. Um, we have uh, Mr. Kazu from the audit office uh, with us. Mr. Kazu. Yes. Oh, I, I, I apologize, Mr. Kazu. Um, the uh, CFO uh, is Gazumpchul. Yes. Mr. May. The purpose of this report is to present the audited financial statements for the year ended 30th of June, 2021 to the public. The draft financial statements were presented to council in the meeting held on 13th of October, and it was resolved to refer them for audit. The Audit Office of New South Wales have completed their audit and issued their independent auditors report in a company with a report on the conduct of the audit. The presentation of the audited financial statements to the public was advertised in the Southern Highland News on 17th of November, and the statements have been available on Council's website with printed copies available at the Civic Centre and Bower Library. In accordance with Section 420 of the Local Government Act, any person may make a submission in writing to Council with respect to Council's audited financial statements or the auditor's reports. Submissions will be received until a close of business on 1st of December. At this point, I'd like to introduce Mr. Michael Kazu, Director of Financial Audit at the Audit Office of New South Wales, who will now present his independent auditor's report and the report on the conduct of the audit. Thank you, Mr. Kazu. Thanks, Mr. May, and good afternoon to all of you. Um, and thank you also for the opportunity for allowing me to present my report to you today. First of all, apologies I couldn't make it in person, our office has still got some restrictions in terms of our traveling. So I wasn't able to make it, but looking forward to making it in, in the near future. So the 2020-21 audit was the second year now where we had to work online remotely, doing an audit remotely, which is always a, a little bit more difficult and can be a bit more time consuming. And when you also consider the changes in personnel at council, it was a huge effort for council to get through the audit process. Um, so I'd like to thank them for their, first of all, their cooperation, but also their professionalism throughout and um, yeah, especially the finance team. So thank you for that. Today I'll be presenting the report on the conduct of the audit. So this report's a publicly available document that it has a high level, I guess it gives a high level analysis on, first of all, on the results of the audit, but also some of the key financial indicators and numbers. So first of all, it's, we we're, were able to express an unmodified audit opinion this year, which is a clean audit opinion. So in effect, it means that from based on the work we performed, 
um, where you're comfortable that there was no material misstatements in the financial statements. So that was a good result. In terms of the income statement, so the, the profit and loss for the year, the, the result was a $33.6 million surplus for council this year, which is fairly consistent with, with the prior year. However, this result also includes the capital grants and contributions. So when they're excluded, there's a slight deficit of $0.7 million. Um, last year, there was a surplus of $5 million when you excluded these grants and contributions. And the main uh, reason for this is just an increase in employee costs this year and also a decrease in the investment income earned this year. In terms of the cash position, for council this year. So the overall cash, cash position increased this year from 8 million in the prior year to 15 million as the 30 June 2021. And this is mainly due to a, a borrowing facility the council entered into of around $6.3 million, which was received before 30 June. However, when you include the investments held by council, the overall balance for um, cash, cash equivalents, and also investments was $192 million. It's important to note also, though, that $152 million of that amount has externally uh, imposed restrictions on it. So, in effect, it's, the council aren't able to use that money for day-to-day -day running of the business. That's held for things such as the water, sewer um, assets, and also developer money coming in from developer contributions that will need to be spent in a specific manner. Um, there's also, of that amount, there's also another additional $40 million where there's no external imposed restrictions, but council have imposed internal restrictions. I guess what, the way you can look at it is there's $40 million allocated already um, to identify programs or works or for future costs that councils, council have earmarked. Some other key points in the, in the report are the ratios. Um, so there are six ratios which are included in here. They're financial ratios. Um, they're the standard ratios that we include every year that gives a bit of a gives everyone a bit of a broad understanding of the position and also the performance of council. Of the six ratios, and if for each of those ratios, there's a benchmark set by Office of Local Government, um, and we've we've included that in our report. So the Good news is the council have been able to exceed all of OLG's benchmarks. So for all six ratios, um, Winter Cabri Shire Council has exceeded OLG's benchmarks. I'll take you through a couple of those reports, uh, a couple of those ratios, just so you can better understand what I'm what I'm referring to. So one of them is the operating performance ratio. So this ratio measures how well council have been able to contain their operating expenditure within the revenue that's been coming in. The benchmark set by the OLG is 0%. So in effect, OLG is saying that the, min the benchmark is breaking even, so spending the same amount of money as you're earning. Council's ratio was 3%. So it's what that shows is they're, they're spending slightly less than the money coming in. Um, I, I guess that you can't usually look at these things in isolation. These can vary from year to year, but it, um, it's something that probably needs to look at over a few years, but I think you'll notice that over the last at least couple of years, the council have been able to exceed the OLG's benchmark for that. Own source operating revenue ratio is another ratio that's included in my report, and this measures council's reliance on external funding. OLG's benchmark here is greater than 60%, so in effect, what they're saying is councils should be looking at um, getting internally generated funding for at least 60% 60, 60 of the money coming in. They should be aiming to at least have that amount um, being internally generated rather than relying on grants and contributions. Council's ratio for this is just over 70%. So once again, they've exceeded the threat ratio there, step by OLG. Unrestricted current ratio is another ratio. Um, this, this represents council's ability to meet its short-term obligations. OLG's benchmark for this ratio is one and a half times. Council has a ratio of just over five. So this essentially what it means is there's $5 available in the short term to meet every dollar of short-term 
liability for the due in the near term. And this ratio has been relatively consistent over the last few years. The next ratio to mention is the debt cover ratio. So this measures the cash available for service debt. Council's ratio of almost eight is well above OHO's benchmark of um, greater than two. The next ratio is rates and annual charges outstanding. So this looks at the percentage of um, rates and annual charges that council haven't been able to, to receive that was billed. Um, count, the benchmark set by OLG for regional and rural councils is to have that percentage of outstanding being below 10% and council is with, well within that with a 6% ratio as of 30 June 2021. Cash expense cover ratio is another one. So this indicates essentially that the number of months, this demonstrates the number of months council could continue making payments without any cash coming in. The benchmark set by OLG is greater than three months and council's ratio is well in excess of that at 22 months. So they're, the, they're the ratios. Another, another part of that report that you'll see in there, we just provide a high level sort of the um, number there on infrastructure property plan equipment renewals. So obviously all councils, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important indicator to ensure that Council spending enough money to ensure that the assets that they're managing are getting renewed. Um, council spent this year 30, just over $31 million on renewing assets. And this is an increase from last year where 26, just over $26 million was spent. And most of that money was spent on roads, um, the water network and sewer, sewer assets. Um, also, we report on compliance. If there's any major issues of non-compliance that we've identified as part of my audit and there's um, no issues of major non-compliance that we've that we identified in the process. So that's a that's a high level summary of the report. I'm happy to take any questions on that. Uh, thanks for that and it's pleasing uh, that the council has a, a good result and all of its ratios are positive. Look, um, I don't get much of a chance to speak to such a high level person at the audit office. Um, so can I draw, take you to the, um, the special schedule relating to depreciation, um, which I know is unaudited. Um, is there any movement in the industry to have this schedule audited that you're aware of? It's a good question, Mr. May. It's, it's something that's come up quite a bit over my years of auditing councils. And I know that a lot of councillors really place a lot of importance on, on that schedule. And it's something that's gotten asked quite a bit. But at the moment, we, ha we don't have the mandate to be auditing it. And I guess one of the things that we'd have to look at before we could even consider doing it is having a framework in place. There's no current framework for us to audit such a such numbers. A lot of it um, quite a lot of you know, management judgment and things like that. So while I definitely agree it's important indicators and something the councillors should be looking at, it's not something that on the horizon at the moment that the audit office is looking at providing an opinion on. You'd be well aware of the influence it can have on the final result of a council, though. In which way are you referring to, sorry, Mr. May? Uh, just in relation to uh, the spend uh, that the council has on its assets uh, compared to what they're valued at. Because if they're not valued appropriately or recognised in accordance with their conditions, uh, that can, at the end of the day, can have a, an impact on the council's financial result. Yes, that's right. So the, I guess if you look at the key things that are in there, they're looking at the, the amount that's getting spent in, in those ratios. From that point of view, we do audit those numbers because they're part of the financial statement. So the number of asset renewals, we do cover that. And then the other part of it is the depreciation, which is also a key indicator in that schedule. And we also obviously look at that and we look at the useful lives and things like that as part of the audit. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I'm 
I, I just have a view in relation to this, and um, I probably you probably could share the view um, that the, these this needs to be uh, there needs to be more attention in the industry uh, to the valuing of assets to ensure that they are valued at their at their true value, um, and hopefully um, this council will be able to come to grips with that over the next few years, because you, it's not, you're not going to do it in one year, but you only need to drive the roads uh, to see the potholes, which uh, this life is historical. Uh, you can't blame the council for generations, but um, I just think the community needs to have a, a better understanding. Okay, the, the only other thing I would just make mention of is you mentioned about the reserves, and the council does have substantial reserves, uh, both externally restricted and internally restricted. Um, internally restricted reserves to a degree uh, are subject to council resolution. Um, and on this business paper, uh, there's an item, uh, we called for a report on a review of the council's financial reserves. Um, that has occurred. Um, I'm not privy uh, to what the outcome of that is. Uh, but the recommendation, in effect, is to refer it to our ARIC for their advice in the first instance, which I think is a good decision. Um, so, you know, the, we're, we're treating the council's finances on behalf of the community very, very strongly and bring it under the microscope as, as you know, any good council should. Uh, having said that, if I could thank you very much uh, for your contribution today. Um, you have nothing else further you want to add? Um, no, nothing else, Mr. May. Just to, just to quickly mention that the, I know you mentioned just previously in the previous point on the valuations and the importance they have, and I can assure you that's always the key focus area for any audit we do of councils. It's the valuations, but at the same time, there is a lot of judgment and there's a complexity to it, and it's not it's not really a, a I guess it's not a science. It's more there's judgment required, and um, it's obviously open to a bit of um, interpretation there. It's definitely a focus area for us. Mm, very much so. Okay, um, if you have anything else you want to add, gentlemen? Okay, um, accordingly, I would move the officer's recommendation. As outlined on page six of the business paper, one, two, and uh, a new three, that Mr. Kazoo uh, be thanked for his attendance and declare that carried. Thanks very much. We won't bore you. You can uh, go and do some real work now. Yeah? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. The next item, 7.3, loans to not-for-profit organisations. I'll do it properly now. General Manager. Thank you, Mr May. Um, Ms Rakamalera will introduce this item. Thank you, Mr May and Ms, Ms. Campbell. Minja Caribbean Shire Council has an extensive history of providing loans to community and not-for-profit organisations over many years. While this financial assistance usually benefits the community through the provision or upgrade of facilities, the previous approach has been ad hoc, inconsistent, and not necessarily focused on strategic priorities. Further, although all assistance packages have been resolved by council, the process is not in alignment with current legislation and guidelines issued by the Office of Local Government. This report provides a summary of current outstanding loans, highlights the legislative framework in which council should be operating and proposes a mechanism by which financial assistance requests can be assessed and decisions made to ensure improved outcomes for the community while sustainably managing council's budget for the long term. Uh, thanks for that. Look, I just emphasize uh, to the uh, groups that are mentioned in the report, um, this is, this is not your fault. Uh, it's the uh, council's fault for letting these kind of things happen. Um, I understand there's a further report uh, coming in relation to this matter, which will deal with some promises that have been made also. Um, could I ask that the, the next report in the schedules um, say the length of time and the repayments 
uh, that are agreed to. Um, you know, when I when I look at this, you know, some of them, you know, one here back to two thousand fourteen, and a very little little amount has been repaid, and I understand it's interest free. Um, you know, which is a problem, but again, I say, you know, it's, it's not the organisation's problem, it's the council's problem that they've created. Um, having said that, um, in relation to item 7.3, uh, I would move the officer's recommendation one and two, as outlined on page nine of the business paper, and declare that carried. Uh, the next item um, is 7.4. Uh, the planning proposal. Um, I don't think there's anyone to introduce this one. Um, and it's a matter that's been before the uh, planning panel, and it's in effect housekeeping. Accordingly, uh, in relation to item 7.4, I would move the officer's recommendation one, two, and three, as outlined on page 18 of the business paper, and declare it carried. Uh, the next one um, is a review of the council's uh, financial reserves. General Manager. Through Mr May, the acting uh, CFO will introduce this item. Or, no, actually, no, the director, sorry, apologies, um, Director Corporate Strategy and Resourcing. Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. May, Ms. Ms. Campbell. Um, so a, a review of council's reserves has been undertaken and a draft financial reserves policy has been prepared. As the ARIC has now been formed, the review of the reserves and the draft financial reserves policy will be presented to the Audit, Risk and Improvement Committee for their review and their input prior to the policy being presented to council. Okay, uh, thanks for that. In relation to item 8.1, um, I would move the officer's recommendation as outlined on page 26 of the business paper and declare it carried. Um, 8.2 um, is the budget review to 30th September. General Manager. Thank you, Mr. May. Now it's the Acting Chief Financial <laughs> Officer. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. May. The purpose of this report is to formally present the results of the budget review undertaken for the period ended 30th of September 2021 and to seek council approval to make the necessary adjustments to, to the 2021-22 budget. The review has identified a range of adjustments required to both income and expenditure with the major variations to the operational budget being shown on page 28 and 29 of the agenda. In summary, these include a reduction in election expenses of $375,000 as the elections for Windsor Caribbean will not be held in December. Due to COVID restrictions, tulip time in 2021 did not proceed as planned. However, we purchased the bulbs and virtual <laughs> tour, but there was no revenue. The Mittagong swimming pool is closed due to flooding and the operational costs and income have been removed from the budget. This is a net saving of $160,000, which will be allocated towards the recreation and aquatic strategy. A reduction in the emergency services levy against budget of $327,000, as council was informed by the New South Wales government that they are providing a one-off payment to fully fund the increase in the 2021-22 emergency services levy to ensure that we pay the same amount as we did in the 2019-20 financial year. A reduction in the employment costs of $232,000 due to the new executive structure being effective from October this year. An increase in legal expenses of $152,000 for legal representation in organisational development. An allocation of $114,000 has been provided to support the service delivery review program. Reviews will be completed on children's services and corporate relations this financial year. A budget allocation of $98,000 has been included for the implementation of the Councillor Portal and Intranet. Council is required to revalue stormwater drainage assets in this financial year, and these valuations will be completed by an independent valuer. 
A budget of $70,000 has been included for this project. A budget of $56,000 is required for resourcing and finance to cover vacancies to ensure we meet statutory financial reporting timeframes. In direct response to a recommendation of the Corporate Services Delivery Review, $50,000 has been provided for the public, pub, public relations communications advice. An allocation of $40,000 has been included for future reviews on asset valuations, the environmental levy, and investing in our future special rating variation. $20,000 has been included to pilot a six month community circles program that aims to support vulnerable members of the community. A comprehensive review of Council's Capital Works Program was undertaken, which resulted in the proposal to reallocate works totaling $32.5 million to the 2022-23 financial year. This is designed to break the cycle of perpetual revotes through a realistic and deliverable program, which will provide greater certainty to the community and is part of the organisation reset program to re-establish credibility of Council to deliver. These adjustments are outlined on page 30 of the business paper. I can also confirm that $300,000 has been included, included for the unexpected latent site condition at the Barrel Memorial Hall. This has been included, included in the budget, but inadvertently omitted from the commentary in the report, and I apologise for that. Um, firstly, uh, if I can congratulate everybody concerned um, with this and the council's administration coming to grips uh, with revotes, um, it's, if you're not going to do it, be upfront and, and say. And I think that's a, a great result. And it's, as you say, it's part of the reset of the council and being honest, open, and transparent with the community you serve. Um, can I just confirm that you have? It seems to me that the, the savings on the executive staff, um, there would be substantial savings through the number of job vacancies. You have an allocation in the budget for job vacancies? Yeah, through you, Mr. May. The annual budget includes a vacancy provision. Thank of, you. Uh, around just under a million dollars across all three funds. 600,000. In the general fund, it's 600, yeah. but yeah. across all three funds, it's just under a million dollars. Just under a million. Yeah. That's fabulous. Thank you. Um, the, in, in relation to tulip time, uh, this is probably a question to the director. Is there going to be a, um, a debrief on? Um, thank you, Mr May. Yes, uh, there will be a report on um, tulip time coming to the next council meeting on, in December. And, and will that involve talking to members of the community? There has already been some discussion and review with um, some members of the community, but we're proposing to go out early next year for a, a, another full debrief of the community. But we have actually had some surveys already go out to the businesses, but we wanted to do a full community review. Mm. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I've just, in relation to the coming to grips with um, works, um, I don't agree with transferring the $150,000 uh, for the design of the animal uh, shelter um, to next year. Um, I was hoping uh, that uh, the animal shelter and the SES, they're both critical matters. Uh, the animal shelter uh, is just not fit for purpose um, and, um, and is an embarrassment, frankly. Um, and the SES... Um, the facilities they have are abysmal. Um, it's not your fault. Um, uh, but they, um, they have to go to Mittagong to train because there's no training facilities uh, where they are, which is, you know, a disgrace considering the fact that, um, you know, they're, they're volunteers. Um, additionally, somebody has suggested to me that there may be an opportunity at the animal shelter for a, um, a commercial content uh, in it, uh, whether that be a, a resident vet or whatever. And I think that's an opportunity that we should explore. I'm not saying we should do it, but we should see what the marketplace uh, says in relation to something like that. So I'm going to change the recommendation um, that comes forward, but in no way am I critical of the outcome. I think um, it's honesty in, in finance. Um, so I would move in relation uh, to 
<clears throat> item 8.2, um, the 2021-2024-22 um, a budget review to 30th of September 2021, that one, Council approved the budget variations reported in the September quarterly review as listed in attachment one to the report, noting that the acting chief finance officer acknowledged that $300,000 has been included as part of the September quarter review for the Barrel uh, Memorial Hall and two, the design for the Southern Highlands Animal Shelter not be transferred um, as a revote to 20. 223, it being noted that the principal design tender document was released on 23 November and is inclusive of the Moss Fail State Emergency Services building design. Further, the document be amended to provide for the possible inclusion of a commercial component within the shelter. And I would declare that carried. Um, in having said that, there will still uh, be consultation uh, with all users of the shelter as we proceed uh, with this, Director. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, uh, we next move to uh, item 8.3, uh, the draft code of meeting practice on page 83. General Manager? Nothing, okay. Um, look, the, um, I generally support this, but um, I have a, a view um, that I, I would like to see the matters raised in my submission to the public inquiry built into the council's um, code of meeting practice um, to show um, that the community, community that the council uh, now has had enough of closed meetings and non-transparent operations um, and making decisions uh, other than in council meetings without delegation. Um, so I would uh, move, I'm not gonna move the officer's recommendation, um, item 8.3, I would move that one, the matter be deferred and referred to the general manager to amend the code of meeting practice to reflect we're not inconsistent with the mandatory provisions, the suggestions of the interim administrator in his submission to the commissioner, Windsor Caribbean Council Public Inquiry, dated 28 October, 2021, with the intent of improving good governance and transparency in the operations of the governing body. Two, the general manager be delegated authority to place the code of meeting practice on public exhibition. Three, it be noted that the prayer used by the interim administrator since his appointment has been all faith. And in the draft code of meeting practice to be exhibited will provide the, and, and the draft code of meeting practice to be exhibited will provide an opportunity for residents to express their view on the inclusion of a prayer at council meetings. And I will declare that carried. Um, item 8.4, uh, uh, the annual report, uh, General Manager. Thank you, Mr May. I'm pleased to table Council's annual report for 2020 to 2021. This report outlines Council's activities for the 2021 financial year, reporting to the community on our achievements, as well as the statutory requirements. I'd just like to take the opportunity to run through some of the highlights, not all, um, from the last 12 months, and I'll table the, the annual report. Highlights include the opening of the Berrima All Abilities Playground and securing funding to upgrade Mossvale's Church Road Oval Playground and Mittagong's Cook Street Park Playground. Allocating 115,000 to 51 community projects as part of Council's annual community assistance scheme. Completing construction of the Church Road Playing Fields Amenities Block and the Elridge Park Netball Courts. Council secured $542,000 
from the federal government funds to refurbish the Mittagong SES Centre. Council also commenced preliminary investigations, including or associated with the designs for the Mossvale Bypass Project. Council progressed the construction of the Mossvale Civic Centre refurbishment project, amended the LEP to provide greater flexibility for tourism and hospitality operators, organised and promoted fire, bushfire recovery and resilience initiatives, including allocating community grant funding, hosting a recovery concert and unveiling a memorial in, in honour of fallen RFS volunteers, Geoffrey Keaton and Andrew O'Dwyer. Council also commenced the refurbishment of works at Barrel Memorial Hall, hosted in-person or virtual events through the COVID period, including Australia Day Citizen of the Year, Young Citizen of the Year, NAIDOC Week festivities, and Learn to Skate workshops. We also replaced over 6.3 kilometres of water and sewer mains, opened the refurbished Seymour Park, in, um, including the off-leash facilities in Mossvale, secured state and federal grant funding to repair the Wombian Caves Road, launched the Winter Caribbean Disaster Dashboard, and commenced drafting an environment and climate change strategy. The year was not without its challenges, including continued post-Black Summer bushfire recovery actions, ongoing COVID-19 pandemic restrictions, including remote working arrangements and the suspension of the council. Despite these obstacles, the staff, the team at Winter Caribbean Council have shown incredible flexibility and resilience over the past year and I'm incredibly proud of them and commend, commend them for their dedication. I look forward to working with the council's new executive, establishing long partnerships with the Highlands community. This report will be sent to the Office of Local Government as required no later than the 30th of November. Thank you, Mr May. Um, would it be possible to incorporate what you've just said into the minutes, please? Um, look, I, I join uh, with the general manager, congratulating everybody. Um, it hasn't all been bad news, unfortunately. Um, people just concentrate on the on on the bad news, bad news, um, and I've been doing my best uh, to acknowledge the fact that it's not all bad news. Uh, the council has done a good job for its community. Okay, look, you might be able to answer this, uh, but it's in relation you said about the Mittagong uh, grant. Um, does, is that Cook, the Cooks for the playground? Is that Cook Street? Um, Mr. May, I have to defer to the yep, group manager. Correct. Um, well, just to let you know, uh, I put you in because um, it was raised at the Welby community meeting the other night and at the Renwick meeting last night. Um, and I indicated that public consultation was about to start, uh, which I'd been told, but I also indicated that a small community meeting uh, would be held uh, with local residents just to discuss what the council is proposing. And I think it'd be great um, if, you know, where the council is doing these kind of works, that we go to the people rather than just doing it um, uh, through the press and, and, and through letters. Uh, you know, it's only, only be an hour, it'd only be short. Um, I certainly wouldn't be going, um, and it wouldn't be the role of the mayor or councillor to go. It's a, it's a council um, uh, staff consultation uh, for them to report if necessary to the council. So um, if you can know, I, I put you in for that last night, sorry. Um, in relation uh, to the council's annual report, I would move, I would note it's tabling um, and um, move the officer's recommendation as outlined on page 208 of the business paper, um, 8.5 Christmas celebrations, general manager. Through Mr. May to the director, corporate strategy and resourcing. Thank you, um, Mr. May and Ms. Ms. Campbell. Um, so at a council meeting held on the 23rd of June, 2021, the interim administrator announced the reallocation of the councillor's $80,000 discretionary fund to uh, fund shire-wide Christmas celebrations um, for community-led activities. Um, the villagers have embraced the Christmas spirit and council has now received requests to waive fees and charges for the higher end use of council facilities. 
To enable this to happen, a resolution of council is required to waive the fees, and this will need to be publicly exhibited as well. Mm. Well, it's a simple matter. The law is the law, isn't it? There's, there's, there's no way around it. Um, can I just confirm whether it's 80,000? You probably won't know, but the acting CFO might know. The 80,000 was added, added to the council's original allocation of about 20, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, so it's in effect over 100 that, that the council's reinvesting or investing uh, for Christmas celebrations uh, this year. And I can tell you, in going to village meetings, they are very happy uh, to have this money. And it's probably feedback's coming back to the staff as well, uh, which I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's good. Um, in relation to item 8.5, I would move the officer's recommendation outlined on page 210 of the business paper and declare it carried. Um, we now move to item 8.6, uh, Old Argyle Road. General Manager. Thank you, Mr May. I'm the Coordinator of Property Services for reintroducing this item. Thank you, General Manager. Mr May, on 14 July 2021, Council resolved to place a proposed road closure of Old Argyle Road Penrose on public exhibition. The section of Old Argyle Road proposed for closure is currently both a road reserve and registered fire trail. The closure is proposed to enable Council to apply for funding to undertake essential upgrade works to the fire trail. The proposed road closure was placed on public exhibition for the period 28 July to 10 September with neighbour notifications sent to adjoining residents. In addition, advertising signs were erected on site and the proposed closure was placed on Council's website and your say, Windsor Caribbean. During the period of public exhibition, 59 submissions were received and the matter was reported back to Council to the Council meeting on 10 November, at which time it was resolved that the matter be deferred for an on-site meeting and inspection. The on-site meeting was held on 17 November with the interim administrator and six community members in attendance. At that meeting, concerns were raised in relation to access and the fact that Old Argyle Road contained significant historical relics. The interim administrator has made inquiries of council staff with a view to ensuring access would still be available to an approved subdivision on an adjoining property and the possibility of the adjoining Crown Road being used as access by the Rural Fire Service. The issue raised at the on-site meeting are addressed in the report and it is confirmed that consultation has been undertaken with both Council's Strategic Land Use Planner and Development Services. This consulta consultation has confirmed that there are no objections to the closure based on historic uh, heritage concerns and that no approved development of land adjoining Old Argyle Royal Road will lose access as a result of the proposed closure. Use of the Crown Road as part of the fire, tra fire trail is a matter that will be raised directly with the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment, Crown Lands. This matter is now referred to Council for decision on the closure. Uh, thanks very much for that. Um, I appreciate uh, the staff's response to the matters that were raised by uh, residents with me. Um, and But to give it a, a bit more teeth, I just would like to build into the recommendation uh, particularly in relation to the Crown Road, um, it just seems to me common sense. I think you'd be a very brave person to drive down the section you're closing at any rate, uh, mm -hmm. unless you were driving a tractor. Um, Agreed, yes. Yeah, it's, yep. uh, it's, it's, it's not fabulous. Um, and, you know, if, if that was to be widened, um, I just can't see how you wouldn't damage some of the heritage uh, that was pointed out to me at any rate. Yeah. So um, I'm happy with the recommendation on page uh, item 8.6 on page 213 of the business paper, one, two, three, and four, but I would add five, negotiate with the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment, Crown Lands, and the Rural Fire Service for the Crown Road running off Old Argyle Road, Bundanoon End, to be utilised as a fire trail uh, with the gate being placed at the eastern end of the Crown Road. Now, I've got eastern end right, haven't I? That's down the yes. bottom of the... Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, I would declare that yeah. carried. 
and thank you for that. Thank, thank you, Ms. May. Um, item 9.1 on page 220. I don't think there's any introduction to that one. In relation to item 9.1, Civic Centre naming of new meeting, meeting rooms, I would move the officer's recommendation one and two as outlined on page 220 of the business paper and declare that carried. <coughs> Item 9.2, uh, community and recreational facil facility strategy. General Manager. Thank you, Mr May. The Director of Service and Project Deliver Delivery will introduce this item. Thank you. Thank you, General Manager. Mr May, it was previously planned to prepare a separate sports facility strategy and an aquatic facility strategy. Council, however, has recently adopted its local housing strategy, which sets out a development pattern across the Shire for the next 20 years. Population forecasts have been undertaken in line with the housing strategy and the overall objectives as outlined in the adopted community strategic plan. As the local housing strategy and demographic forecast and review have re recently been undertaken, there's a need to take a strategic view for planning and delivery of community and recreational infrastructure to ensure that the provision of local, district and regional facilities are in the most appropriate locations to meet the current and future needs of the community. It's recommended to take a strategic approach to ensure the best use of community funds in the delivery of local district and regional facilities and services. It is therefore proposed that a community and recreational facility strategy is prepared as one integrated document instead of developing separate strategies. The community and recreational facility strategy will guide the delivery of a sustainable and equitable network of facilities located in strategic and accessible positions across the local government area. The strategy will also provide an evidence base to secure community benefit from new development as new housing is delivered. Um, thank you. And in a way, this is the most important matter on the business papers tonight, in, in my view. This shows a change in the direction of the council to strategic um, thinking. And the community must be able to take advantage of um, the, the um, potential uh, community public benefit in upzonings. Um, people don't like hearing this, but the reality is that landowners just shouldn't get the windfall. Uh, it's got to be spread. Um, and um, I think it's probably just a small amount that would come out of, of, of potential upzonings, uh, but the council has no idea at the moment where these facilities should be uh, located. Um, so it's very important that the council gets its act together. Um, I applaud uh, the quick quickness of this report. Uh, it has been um, suggested since we adopted the residential strategy. Um, is there any idea how long this will take to do? Or how long's a bit of string? Um, through you, Mr May, uh, obviously community consultation and involvement is very important in this process and obviously that will take time. Uh, but we are hopeful that we uh, could get the final strategy to uh, you for our council uh, for approval by July. Mm. I I think you'll be lucky to do it by July, but I think the important thing is that it's just another thing that we're doing so that when democracy returns, the elected body will be able to hit the ground running uh, with this type of thing. They will have good information to make tough decisions that they, they, they're going to have to make. And I just repeat, I just can't believe um, the lost opportunity for this community by all the development uh, that has occurred. Um, you know, it's 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 not a good look and it's something you know that gets continually raised um, with me um, about you know where are 
good facilities rather than tied facilities that a lot of the facilities around the place appear to me uh, to be. So this is great news. I congratulate everybody, but I'm going to make a slight amendment uh, to the recommendation. Um, I would move the recommendation outlined on page 223 at the business paper as item one and an item two uh, would be the brief for the community and recreational facility strategy be publicly available. I think it's important that the community also sees um, you know, what is going on on their behalf uh, to improve um, the, uh, the, the, the community they live in. Uh, and I declare that carried. Um, that finishes what's on the business paper. Um, I did ask uh, Mr. Horn if he could stay. Um, the, the council um, is um, funding lights and uh, quite a bit over Christmas, but part of it is um, for uh, Christmas trees in Mittagong, Barrel um, and Moss Vale. Um, and as in effect the mayor, I was asked to turn the lights on. I think it's more appropriate that we ask school kids uh, to do it. Um, so we wrote to the 26, I think it is, uh, schools in the Shire and asked whether they would like to participate um, in this. Um, and all they had to do was say yes and organise for a student to come at a certain time. And we also said we'd um, give $100 to the students so they could uh, buy their parents and siblings um, a milkshake or something to help the local economies in the town. Unfortunately, despite two emails, only four councils came, uh, four schools came back to us, which I must say I found um, not fabulous. Uh, so, in the new year, I'm going to visit every school and every principal uh, to find out why they're not engaging with their council. Um, so more work for me, but uh, someone's got to do it because we've got to engage with everybody we possibly can. Um, so there's four. Um, and so I'll, I'll ask you to, uh, there's one school that's going to miss out. We'll have to do something for them. Um, but if I could ask you to come forward, Mr. Horn and... Yeah. So we'll do it alphabetically. The, the first one will be what, Barrel? And the winner is Robinson Public School. So Robinson Public School, yep. Someone can write Barrel on that for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, so this might be what, uh, Mittagong? The winner is St Paul's Catholic Parish Primary School. Where's that at, I wonder? Oh, it's running the main street uh, in Moss Vale, is it? Oh, out yeah, along Lacey Road? Uh, Street. G Garrick, yeah, yeah, I went out there looking for Beaconsfield Road today. <laughs> yep, and this makes one's Moss Vale. I yeah. oh, saw. Oh, we're going to get that onto Moss Vale because it's local. Okay, um, yeah, you're the chairman of the committee. <laughs> <laughs> Exeter Public School. Exeter Public School will be doing Mittagong. Okay, well, thanks very much for that. And, and the school who's missed out will uh, we'll sort something out for them. But uh, thank you for your attendance, everybody. And uh, we'll see you in two weeks at the council meeting. And I uh, will have an interim administrator's report for that one. Um,